Sri Krishna, Chaitanya, Bhumi Chinana, Shaviya, Gnadhar, Srivas, Vigorvakana. <clears throat> so this is biography of his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, founder Charya of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. It's a biography. And it has been written by Satsvarup Das Goswami. Wonderful, a wonderful uh, service. Krishna, he began, it's in six volumes. And I remember when he began the interviews and gathering the information from different sources about Prabhupada's life. It was right after Prabhupada left. They didn't waste any time. It's right after Prabhupada left, they started the biography because they didn't want to get lost or things confused or materials um, to disappear, recordings, letters, all those things. In the course of time, they can get lost. So they started right away, the research. And um, I remember when he was doing it, he was staying at the farm project, Kitanagri. He had a little cabin uh, on the edge of the woods, way back, away from everything. And he was absorbed in writing a biography of Prabhupada. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. Okay, so here we go. Prabhupada is in Vrindavan, and he's thinking of going to the West. So, alone and poor, Abai returned to Vrindavan. He, he was in Vrindavan, and then he left Vrindavan to try to do, uh, to go to America, to start the League of Devotees again, and nothing was working. So he went back to Vrindavan. He was 62, but he wasn't thinking of retiring. More than ever, his mood was reflective and renounced. Because few people knew him, and because he wanted to write, he kept to himself. He enjoyed deep peace as a resident of Vrindavan. Outside his window, the sacred Yamuna flowed in a peaceful panorama for his private audience. The Keshigat neighborhood was quiet, though in the Pridan he could hear a few devotees bathing and chanting. When the moon was full, the river seemed like a coolly resplendent jewel. And in the morning, the sun would appear like a red smudge, a fire burning through an opaque wall, at last bursting forth, bursting forth and clearing the entire sky until the hot blaze of noon, while the room would be in shadows. Abai could see from his window a shimmering sun high in the sky and glittering across the silver sheet of the gentle river. Without so much as leaving his room, from his doorway, he could see hundreds of temples clustered together for miles in the friendly town of Vrindavan. The various punctual kirtans and bell ringings in the temples, the spontaneous songs to Lord Krishna in numerous homes and in the streets rose and filled the air with devotion. On the veranda, a bai could chant japa, and there would be no interruption. He enjoyed a simple, almost carefree life of minimized physical wants. A few hours rest at night, a little prashadam at noon, the simplest clothing. And he did not have to flatter anyone, support anyone, or manage anyone's life. His mind and intelligence were free and dwelt constantly on his service to his spiritual master. He saw his present circumstances as a preparation for a greater task before him. Despite his advanced age, he felt that he had barely begun his work, yet he felt confident. He had his vision of a world association of devotees. And it was not an idle dream, although he was not certain how it would all come about. 
but he knew his duty. For the present, he would go on describing his vision, the vision of his predecessor's spiritual masters in articles and books. But as soon as possible, he should go to the West. Westerners, he had concluded, were not satisfied with a materially comfortable life devoid of spiritual understanding. More than his fellow Indians, they would be open to the message of the absolute truth. He knew he should go, and he would go, if Krishna desired. Abai lived frugally in Vrindavan, keeping exact account of every expenditure and every receipt. He carefully kept a ledger just as if he were running a substantial business, even though his purchases were a little milk and a few vegetables, charcoal for cooking, bus rides, and his major expenditure, postage. Abai composed the Bengali poem, Vrindavan Bhajan. Its opening stanzas were especially self-reflective and personal. So here are, looks like, four stanzas from this poem. I am sitting alone in Vrindavan Dham. In this mood, I'm getting many realizations. I have my wife, sons, daughters, grandsons, everything. But I have no money, so they are a fruitless glory. Krishna has shown me the naked form of material nature. By his strength, it has all become tasteless to me today. Yas yaham anu granami harisyetad danam sanai. This is the verse that Prabhupada saw when he was a young man, and it struck him. And he keeps remembering this verse. So this translation, I gradually take away all the wealth of those upon whom I am merciful. How was I able to understand this mercy of the all-merciful? Everyone has abandoned me, seeing me penniless. Wife, relatives, friends, brothers, everyone. This is misery, but it gives me a laugh. I sit alone and laugh. In this maya samsara, whom do I really love? Where have my loving father and mother gone now? And where are all my elders who were my own folk? Who will give me news of them? Tell me who. And all that is left of this family is a list of names. Text uh, stanza three. As the froth on the seawater mixes again in the sea, Maya Samsara's play is just like that. No one is mother or father or personal relative. Just like the sea foam, they remain for a short time, just as the froth on seawater mixes again in the sea. The body, made of five elements, meets with destruction. How many bodies does the embodied soul take in this way? His relatives are all related merely to the temporal body. Stands of four. But everyone is your relative, brother, on the spiritual platform. This relationship is not tinged with the smell of Maya. The Supreme Lord is the soul of everyone. In relation to Him, everyone in the universe is the same. All your relatives, brother. They're all they are all your relatives, brother. All the billions of jivas, when seen in relationship to Krishna, they are all in harmony. Forgetting Krishna, the jiva desires sense gratification, and as a result, he's firmly grasped by maya. <clears throat> On an October visit to Delhi, Abai received a donation from Kaviraj Vaidya, not Sirkar, to be used for printing 1,000 copies of Back to Godhead. Abai promptly produced an October 20 issue of Back to Godhead with the donor's name on the front page. It was the first issue in two years. 
Another donor, Mr. Subha Kumar Kapoor of Ramlal Kapoor and Sons, followed Mr. Sikar's example and donated 1,000 copies for the November 20th issue. This is 1962, evidently. The front page article in the November issue was Truth and Beauty, an editorial in the Times of India speculating on whether truth and beauty were compatible, had opined that truth was not always beautiful, but often ugly and unpleasant. Abai disagreed. Truth is so beautiful that many sages, saints, and devotees have left everything for the sake of truth. But we are habituated to love untruth from time immemorial in the name of truth. Abai agreed, however, that mundane truth and beauty were incompatible. Mundane truth and beauty were incompatible. Not only was mundane truth not beautiful, it was not truth. And mundane beauty was not real beauty. To explain, Abai told a story. Oh, yeah. Okay. Hare Krishna. We used to do this as a play on Sundays for the, for the guests. So this is a story. Once, a man fell in love with a beautiful girl who tried to resist the man's advances. When he persisted, she requested that he wait for seven days, after which she would accept him. During the next seven days, the girl took a strong purgative and laxative and repeatedly passed stool and vomited. She stored the refuse in buckets. Thus, the so-called beautiful girl became lean, lean, thin like a skeleton, and turned blackish in complexion, and the beautiful eyeballs were pushed into the sockets of the skull. The man appeared on the scene well-dressed, well-behaved, and asked the waiting girl, who was depressed in appearance, about the beautiful girl who called him there. The man could not recognize the waiting girl as the same beautiful girl whom he was asking for. The same girl, however, was in a pitiable condition, and the foolish man, in spite of repeated assertion, could not recognize her. It was all due to the action of the medicine only. At last, the girl told the powerful man all the story of her beauty, and told him she had separated the ingredients of her beauty and stored them up in the reservoirs. She also told him that he could enjoy the juices of beauty stored up in the reservoirs. The mundane poetic or the lunatic man agreed to see the juices of beauty, and thus he was direct, directed to the store of stool and liquid vomit, which were emanating unbearable bad smells. And thus, the whole story of liquid beauty was disclosed to him. We used to do that skit on Sundays for the guests. Liquid beauty. <clears throat> So that was from an article that Prabhupada wrote in the November issue, Truth and Beauty. Abai went on to assert that literature, which not, did not describe the ultimate truth and beauty of the Supreme Person, was no better than stool and vomit, even though it be presented as poetry and philosophy. In standard morality, Abai explained, morality is the standard of activity by which the supreme authority is satisfied. The scriptures contain moral codes prohibiting unholy sex relations, animal slaughter, intoxication, and gambling. Abai attributed Mahatma Gandhi's success as a public leader to his observance of these moral principles. Abai also praised the Vedic system of marriage. Quote, after the attainment of puberty, a woman wants a male, and if she's not married within that time and allowed to mix up with boys, it's quite natural that there is every chance of fall down either by the boy or the girl." End quote. Despite changing conditions, Abai argued, you cannot indulge in unholy connection with the opposite sex just because the social conditions have changed, because unholy connection with women is the beginning of all immorality. 
So there's a, that was the article called Standard Morality. And now also there's an article called Scholars Deluded. Abai presented a critical review of Dr. Radhakrishna's edition of Bhagavad Gita, citing specifically the 34th verse of the ninth chapter, where Lord Krishna declares that one should always think of him, become his devotee. Dr. Radhakrishna had commented, it's not the person Krishna to whom we have to give ourselves utterly, but the unborn, beginningless, eternal, who speaks through Krishna. Although the obvious meaning of Bhagavad Gita was that one should surrender to Krishna, the Supreme Person, impersonalists like Dr. Radhakrishna obscured the direct meaning with their word jugglery. So those were the articles in that edition, November 1962 edition, uh, Truth and Beauty, Standard Morality, and Scholars Deluded. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna.